welcome everyone to our coffee break with the Saskatoon Council on Aging. We are a community-based nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting positive aging for all. We, you'll be hearing today from two experts on navigating the healthcare system. The Council on Aging themselves have a wide variety of health resources for older adults. Through our resource center, we provide callers and visitors with information referrals they need. We also have a caregiver information and support center, which is the only one in this province. The caregiver center provides workshops and presentations of interest to caregivers. We have two informative websites, www.scoa.ca, or you can Google Saskatoon Council on Aging. The other one is our caregiver site at www.saskatooncaregiver.ca. And you can also Google Caregiver Information Center and it should pop up. The Caregiver Center has a resource guide for caregivers and we also have a really handy directory of activities and services for older adults. That publication is free and the, Sask or the Saskatchewan Health Authority provided some funding to print us some copies. So if you want a copy of that or to find out more, please call our office at 652-2255. Now, if you have any questions during this webinar, please use the, the little chat icon. Now, depending on your, your device you are using, it will show either on the top of your screen or it might show on the bottom. You simply click on it and type in your question. We have a staff person monitoring this feature throughout the webinar and they will get back to you. And there are also students available today to provide technical support. So if you can't find something on your screen or just need that additional help, you can phone 306-966-2496. You can leave your name and number and they will respond right away. Now, I would like to welcome our moderator for today, Shan Landry. Shan is a lifelong member of the Saskatoon community and she is committed to improving the quality of life and health for all. Shan has worked for 34 years at the Saskatoon Health Region, now called the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Most of those years, she served as the Vice President of Community Services. Shan is passionate about the determinants of health and working with others to create a system and a community that sponsors and supports the mind, body, and spirit. In Shan's retirement, she is offering her knowledge and enthusiasm through consulting and also as a volunteer with a number of organizations. Shan has served on the board of the Saskatoon Council on Aging as chair and also continues to volunteer on our Age-Friendly Community Development Committee. Our Age-Friendly Committee is the committee responsible for organizing these coffee chats. So now I'd like to welcome Shan. Thank you very much, June. That was a very kind introduction and I'm very pleased to be here this morning. And uh, we've made reference to it as a coffee break and I'm not sure how many people like me will have taken that literally, but I did bring my coffee to sip uh, while I'm listening with interest. When we first started planning these uh, SCOA get-togethers and learning opportunities, we talked way back when about a lunch and learn opportunity, envisioning that we would invite people to come to our offices at the field house, maybe in a meeting room there, bring their lunch, and share ideas and learn together. Obviously COVID uh, put a stop to that whole notion, but as we talked more and also learned through a survey with some of our members about um, some of the things that they wanted to know more about during COVID, we came up with this idea of a coffee break. And uh, we all know, even if we're staying at home, which we should be, that uh, having a coffee and then being able to listen in and at least see a few other faces on the screen is a, a good way of getting some ideas into our heads and getting some questions answered. So we settled on that coffee break idea and I think the last one on technology last month was a great success. 
So for this month, um, the subject that many of the members of SCOA had told us that they were interested in hearing more about was something called navigating the healthcare system. Now, as you learned from my introduction, I worked for a long time in the healthcare system. And even I, after 35 years, would say that there are challenges in understanding that system. So it's no wonder that people um, who don't have that kind of experience are thinking, what happens um, when I need to access the system? How do I go about it? So we're very fortunate today to have two um, individuals, one who can speak more from a provincial perspective and one from a slightly more local perspective who will help us focus in on some of the things we need to know about navigating the healthcare system. I will introduce um, our speakers one at a time. Uh, however, I'll tell you that they are Sangeeta Gupta and Deborah Ginther. And I will first of all invite Sangeeta um, to speak to us from her position as a, a manager of the 811 health line in the province. And before I even get to that, uh, one other thing that I wanted to let you know is when we were asking Deborah and Sangeeta to prepare their presentations for us, we tried to figure out how we could get a little bit of commonality or get them to dive down into some of the things we wanted people to, to know in their 15 minutes. So we gave them two little scenarios. One of the scenarios was, I think my father has the beginnings of dementia. What services might be available to support him to stay at home with my mother? The second part of that was, what kind of caregiving assistance will there be there for my mother to help care for him? And finally, what will happen if he requires more care and she is unable to look after him at home? That was one of the first scenarios. The second scenario we asked Sangeeta and Deborah to think about as they prepared their remarks was, what kind of housing is available for a person who's not able to live independently any longer due to a chronic health condition? And what criteria would be used to decide what kind of care would be required? Who can help me and how? So setting the stage for those two things, um, I know they have both prepared some excellent presentation for you. And I will first of all introduce to you Sangeeta Gupta. Sangeeta is the manager of the 811 Health Line, as I said. She's a medical radiation technologist who worked in healthcare for over 25 years. She has worked in various clinical settings, involved in direct patient care, while completing management and leadership certification. Sangeeta's passion for improving the patient experience is what led her to management roles where she's developed and led several programs and teams. With her 11 years as a Canadian Cancer Society's Cancer Information Specialist and Client Advocate, she provided up-to-date information, emotional support, resources, and referral services to people who were impacted by cancer. And as the manager of the screening program for breast cancer, Sangeeta implemented new di digital technology for mammography, including updates to the mobile screening bus. Currently, Sangeeta is the Healthline 811 manager responsible for operations of the inbound, outbound call programs and project lead for new programs and innovations. After doing all of that during her hours away from the office, Sangeeta spends time with her husband, her two sons and her parents. She enjoys expressing her artistic side through music, dance, acting and cooking. Sangeeta, the floor is yours for the next 15 minutes or so. Okay, good morning everyone and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I thought we would begin with a presentation um, on what Healthline offers and um, after that I can address some of the questions um, uh, that you have presented, uh, Shan. Uh, so um, I'm going to start a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so my name, of course, is Sangeeta Gupta, and um, I just want to let you know that Healthline, are you able to see my screen okay, everyone? Uh, no, we can't see it. Oh, you can't. Hold on a second. Give me a second. Technical difficulties here. Give me a second. Share my screen. Here we go. Okay. There we go. Are you okay there now? Yep. 
Excellent. All right, so Healthline 811 is a provincial telephone triage service that provides um, free confidential um, uh, mental health and health care advice uh, 24 hours a day to the people of Saskatchewan. Um, we are staffed by registered nurses, registered psychiatric nurses, and registered social workers. Um, how do you reach 811? You dial 811, and if you're experiencing technical difficulties, you dial 1 877 800 0002. Um, we also have contracted Can Talk for translation services with over 100 different languages available. Um, Healthline 811 clinicians basically conference in a translator, and there is no cost to the caller at all. Um, for deaf and hard of hearing residents, they can access 811 by using the SASTEL relay operator at 1-800-855-1155. Now, Healthline 811 clinicians assist in helping callers make decisions about their health care options. So we do a triage and arrive at dispositions that could include treating symptoms at home. So we'll provide some home care advice, go to a medical clinic or see the primary health care provider in either four hours, 72 hours, 24 hours, depending on what the symptoms are and how the assessment goes. And if it's an emergency, then of course, to access emergency medical services. Um, Healthline 811 also aids in directing the caller to the right level of care with the right provider in the right place at the right time. Um, assessment of patients' concerns, and we provide assessments and triage of symptoms, uh, connection to community services, as well as health teaching and information. Uh, we also provide short-term mental health support, uh, crisis support and intervention, and strategies to manage your present situation. Um, topics include, um, but are not limited to, depression, anxiety, grief, dementia, financial concerns, mobility, housing, and more. Um, right now, because um, COVID, of course, 19 has our lines extremely busy right now, we do have a callback feature that's available and we encourage you to utilize um, because, uh, you know, our call volume has uh, have actually increased by 400% right now. Um, we do provide COVID-19 teaching and referral to testing and assessment sites, um, transfer callers um, to a physician. So for example, once we triage you and if you have a disposition of needing to see a physician, a primary health care provider within four hours, we have the ability to transfer to a physician and they can either do a video or phone consult and do a triage that way um, as a next step for our, from the findings of Healthline 811. Uh, we utilize, so we never speak off the cuff, we have a very um, evidence-based, um, highly uh, scientific, uh, Schmidt, Schmidt Thompson developed protocols that we utilize. They are further Canadianized and then Saskatchewanized and reviewed by our medical director. So they're very, very specialized and customized to Saskatchewan. Um, when we arrive at a disposition, say for example, um, uh, that someone needs to see a physician in four hours, we will never downgrade a disposition to say you need to see someone in 72 hours. We might upgrade because of the clinician's uh, knowledge um, and, and, um, personal, and their experience in terms of what they believe should be the next step. So um, we also rely on clinical judgment as well. Dr. Horner is our medical director and reviews calls uh, on a monthly basis as part of a call auditing and uh, process improvement process. Um, we also have a suicide call management whereby utilize, we utilize two clinicians to manage a suicide call. So one clinician basically will assess for safety and initiates the most, the least disruptive plan of care. So for example, they may say that, you know, you can call a family member or um, uh, a neighbor, a friend. Um, we would utilize that approach as opposed to something more critical, but some, sometimes people need more emergent help. So we might need to, um, um, call in mobile crisis or emergency services to help the person. 
Uh, we engage the caller until help arrives on the scene, and then we transfer the care to the help. Um, the secondary clinician basically offers the additional support in contacting um, the caller's requested contact or an authority figure. Um, callers to Healthline are, like I said, our calls have increased. So if I look at the statistics and share that with you from April 1st, 2020 to September 30th, um, we have a total of uh, our registered callers are 78,660. Our COVID calls are over 136,000 patients registered and um, 1,853 for mental health. Uh, mental health services is sort of our best kept secret. Not as many people know that we actually have registered health professionals on the mental health service line and it's accessible 24 hours a day by calling 811. Um, then also in terms of our top triage protocols utilized um, for physical symptoms, it would be adult chest pain, sore throat, pediatric fever of three months and older, um, abdominal pain for females, and breathing difficulty. For mental health protocols, our anxiety and panic attack is the most utilized protocol. Um, depression, um, alcohol abuse and dependence, suicide concerns, as well as substance abuse and dependence. So a lot of people think that we send everyone to ED, but we actually don't. Of all the calls during that time period, we have sent 27% of our callers to the emergency department. Um, and a lot of the times it's, this is based on um, the hours of availability. So for example, someone who has been calling from a rural area, they have a higher chance of being sent to emergency department because they have no other services that might be available to them. So 58% of the patients who were advised to go to ED now called Healthline during uh, the weekend, statutory uh, holidays between the hours of 8 p.m. and 8 p.m. So after regular, regular clinic hours and people may not be available uh, to provide care during that time. And so we have no choice but to send to ED. Um, we also work in partnership with MedSask. Um, and I don't know if everyone knows about the service, but it's a provincial service and um, uh, they are accessible through 1-800-665-3784. Um, um, they provide uh, information to the general public on prescription medications, non-prescription medications and herbal products. Uh, they do not provide advice regarding poisonings or illegal or illicit drugs, but um, and they don't provide advice regarding diagnosis and treatment in emergency situations. Um, they are available from 8 a.m. to midnight, Monday to Friday, and 5 p.m. to midnight on weekends and holidays. And callers can also leave messages after hours. Uh, we also work with Poison Control, um, and they're based out of Alberta. Um, and the toll-free Saskatchewan number is 1-866-454-1212. Of course, if a person calls, we can transfer to, to these services as well. And we work in collaboration with public health through some of our outbound programs as well. Um, so some of our outbound programs, we have the Maternal Wellness Program that's initiated in 2013. It's a provincial program since January 2017. And the idea is to provide uh, support to clients at risk of or suffering from postpartum depression and or anxiety, or those who've experienced a perinatal loss. It's a mental health program serviced by our mental health clinicians. We have the Breast Cancer Lymphedema Program, which was initiated in 2016 for the Regina Service Area. And the purpose of this program is to provide assessment, education, and service information for clients who've undergone a mastectomy or lumpectomy with lymph node dissection or who are currently receiving um, cancer treatment and are at risk of or currently suffering from breast cancer related lymphedema. This is a registered nurse um, service. We also have the COPD pilot program that, start, it, it, that initiated in the Tisdale area in 2017. And the purpose of this program was to improve the quality of life for people with COPD and it aimed to reduce uh, the severity of exacerbations and readmissions related to COPD. Um, also a um, registered nurse project um, or service. 
Um, we have something on hold. We started in the Regina service area uh, for COPD, whereby um, a person who was just being discharged from hospital would get a call 48 hours after discharge from hospital to provide assessment, support, and education. And this also is a nursing program. Um, we utilize a decision support system called PhoneMed. We have a very sophisticated telephony system. Um, we provide education and training and quality monitoring uh, of our calls. Um, Healthline Online is also supported through Healthline 811. And we do data analysis for decision making. Um, PhoneMed is our cloud-based application and basically is um, interfaced with your sh the shared client index, which is like a repository for your health card. So we can get um, your information and demographic information to register into the system. Um, and that's sort of our electronic chart on a person. Um, we have the ability to customize um, uh, surveys and protocols that we use within the decision support system. Um, Healthline 811 trains all of our staff on site uh, using standard training processes. We develop all of our orientations and programs in-house. Um, we have job aids and work standards um, and uh, to support all the work that's being done here by clinicians. There's a number of clinicians here. Um, we have hundreds of clinicians. So in order to make sure that everything is streamlined, we, we utilize job aids and work standards to help that process. Um, we also um, have standardized processes of evaluation to maintain and improve the clinician experience to identify any training gaps and the quality of service that we provide. Uh, clinicians are also provided uh, components of the evaluation and our, we monitor our cl clinicians on a regular basis and provide them with the results of their quality monitoring. Um, one of the main purposes of the program is to develop the clinician's skills by encouraging positive feedback, constructive feedback and guidance for improvement. Um, we're in an environment that we are constantly on a day-to-day -day basis looking and striving for improvement. Um, we have our clinical nurse educator, uh, the clinician themselves that do their monitoring. Uh, we have peer reviews of, um, of calls. Uh, so a nurse may be reviewing another nurse's calls, for example, our medical advisor, the managers, they're all reviewing calls. Um, as well as call calibration is being done. So when we, when I talk, when I'm talking about call calibration, it's so that we can all arrive at a similar result. We have a process so that we are all looking at the same calls in the same way, um, and we do documentation audits of the clinical records as well. Um, we report on key performance indicators. Although right now, because of COVID-19, we have been inundated and have not been able to meet our target service level of 85% of calls being answered within 120 seconds. Um, for this reason, we really strongly do uh, recommend utilizing a callback um, option that's available. Um, our average talk time by the clinician group um, uh, without COVID is 10 minutes for the nurses and 16 minutes for uh, the mental health clinician. Um, on average, that time would be doubled right now um, for the uh, uh, nurses because we are doing referrals to assessment as well as um, uh, testing sites and that's taking up extra time. Um, also, the process, we process our charts afterwards and we allow two minutes for the nurses and five minutes for mental health. Um, we also monitor that people are doing the right thing at the right time, it's called schedule adherence. So we're making sure that people are taking their appropriate breaks. Um, and if it, it sometimes helps us identify if there's something else going on, if calls are taking extra long, what's going on in the contact center. Whoopsie, I lost my light here. Um, and um, we also have Healthline Online that's available through the SHA website. Um, it contains uh, topics, videos, and tools, especially for those who are wanting to do some research before even calling us. Um, they, it, they have a symptom checker, um, for health conditions, for wellness and prevention. They have uh, topics specific to different life stages as well. So it is a web-based tool that assists residents to make better health decisions. And it is evidence-based. So if you're not using Dr. Google, you're using some evidence-based information um, at a time and a place that's convenient. So you can do your searching online by yourself.
Can Sankita, can I just re remind you, we only about another minute or so. Okay, actually, and that's, I, I think that should be enough for me. And this is the sort of the outside of our building and what our contact center looks like inside and our training room. And that's it. Okay, thanks. I didn't mean to make you <laughs> about to stop. No, but, I, but uh, in terms of, I do have uh, some responses to your questions that you had asked, and I don't know if you want that now or maybe later on. Um, why don't we Why don't we move on? Give Deb a chance to do her her presentation, and then we'll have had some questions come in from uh, some of the people. I've had a couple so far, um, but we're going to save those until afterwards. So. Thank you very much, Sangeeta, and Thank it was you. more information that I could digest. Um, <laughs> and I hope we'll have a copy of your slides so that we can review them later too. For sure. Okay. And now I'm going to um, introduce you to our second presenter, um, Deborah Ginther. And uh, Deborah is the manager of the Client Patient Access Service or CPAS, as it gets called for short. And she's worked with the Saskatchewan Health Authority for over 25 years. Currently, she's a manager, as I said, with CPAS. And before that, she worked in the region as a registered nurse, both in inpatient and outpatient settings, and as a client care coordinator. Deborah holds a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from the University of Saskatchewan and recently completed an MBA in Community Economic Development through Cape Breton University. At the time, her research project focused on direct client funding as an alternative to long-term care. So I wish we could have a whole presentation on that sometime, Deborah, as well. But uh, please welcome Deborah, who lives in Saskatoon with her husband, Scott, their three children and their great Dane, Daisy, and as I said, is the manager of CPAS in Saskatoon. Welcome, Deborah. Need to get you to unmute. Sorry. Um, we did do a trial on this, and now I'm sort of lost. But here, I just want to get this up and running. Um, Okay, can everybody see that slide presentation? Yes. Okay, so this is our um, our presentation to give to the community in that. We've been asked for this presentation to focus on um, a couple where the husband has um, dementia. So I will try to, as we go through this, I'll try to interject what that looks like for that individual in the different steps here. So Client Patient Access Services is a department of the Saskatchewan Health Authority in Saskatoon. It is a single entry point for a variety of community services and resources, and we'll go through those, and it provides case management services. Um, the purpose is to connect people to community resources in order to help them remain independent in their home and to assess for, for and facilitate long-term care admissions when required. We do this through a team approach where we work with everybody in the system. So we work with the CCAs, we work with doctors, we work with um, home care nursing, we work with the nursing in the hospital. Everybody is somebody part of our team in the system. Um, so uh, community services. Um, so home care is a piece of that. And home care has two different parts to it. It provides, um, there's, there's the CCA piece and there's the nursing piece. So the CCA piece would provide things like AM care, HS care, bathing, mobility, um, meal prep, homemaking. So somebody with dementia might ask, ask access those services if they're not able to manage or their spouse isn't able to help them. Um, generally, um, these aren't the first services that uh, somebody with dementia would um, access, but um, they are available to them. Um, so the nursing care would nursing treatments such as teach um, medication management, there's teaching, they, they do wound care, there's the high, home IV antibiotic therapy, and there's chronic disease management. 
So again, somebody with dementia, they may use any of these, but one of the ones that is very common um, used with people with dementia is medication management. So they would support, uh, if you're living with your spouse who's able to manage those meds, we might, home care might set it up so that they, um, the, so the spouse could manage it. Or even with somebody with early dementia, they might set them up so they're able to follow their medication regime um, independent, quite independently. So they would do their own assessment and decide there. Um, other community services available to um, the community are um, a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, social work, pharmacist, dietitian, speech language, pathology, and any of those might be used. It depends on the need. We also have a program called Seniors First, and that is a multidisciplinary team that works together at, um, they, they often take on people that are in a bit of a crisis or there's things happening that um, the client's not managing well in the community. So they will work, there's doctors on that team and that they will work to stabilize the person and then they will generally pass them back to the community to work with. The, like the client care coordinator in them. Okay, other services. I just want to um, make note that all these services are available based on an assessed need. And that's where the CPAS home care or the CPAS coordinator would assess. So Meals on Wheels is a, um, another option. Um, individualized funding, which is an alternative to home care and it provides uh, resort, financial resources to to hire your own um, care. Um, there's community day programs. Um, I'm going to bunch these together. Community day programs, respite, both unplanned and planned, are something that a client with dementia would t often use. So the community day programs would offer um, a client one, two, three days a week to go to a community day program. And that actually gives the caregiver also a break so on those days, the caregiver is able to get their groceries, have some alone time, whatever it is that they need to do that helps support them care for their, their loved one. Um, respite is, there is also, there is very minimal respite available through home care, but there is some in the home, but there is also in long-term care and respite, both planned and unplanned. So planned is that, you know, you're going on a trip, you want to go to your niece's wedding in another um, province and so you would book that respite. Unplanned is something um, uh, the caregiver was to fall and break their hip and we needed to get a plan in place quickly. We might look at unplanned. Just to let you know, these are services and the home care um, that have been greatly impacted by COVID. Right now, the community day programs aren't running. We are very limited to some unplanned respite beds in the community. Um, home care and all the services are fluctuating on a daily basis of the ability, not on a daily basis, but as COVID has increased, the, the amount of services that there is is, is not as much and they are um, prioritizing the visits and going through that. So although all these services theoretically are available, they may not be there right today. Um, so somebody that was with, I'm, I'm going to back up and then I'm gonna group the second question about accessing long-term care and, and stuff like that. Um, so we would look at, maintaining somebody in their home to begin with. So we would look at home care services, linking them to private services, um, anything that we could help support the client and their spouse in that home. We may look at, and my slides, I'm gonna go ahead and then come back to this one. We, so there's private services. Um, we might look at other housing options, such as personal care homes and enriched housing. Um, Sorry, just to add there, we also will come out, this isn't about housing, but would help with um, advanced healthcare directives as we provide information on that. So when you're looking at the continuum of care, we would try to support you in your home with home care services and that. So starting with, um, like you would have home care to help with your basic care needs. Um, it might help you with your cooking and, and cleaning and things like that. 
So when those things can no longer be supported well in the home and things are still breaking down, there is an option of enriched um, and assisted living. Now, enriched and assisted living is not, there's not a lot more care, but there is, there's people around you, there's um, their watch, like people would know if you didn't come out of your suite for a day or two. So there is some sort of built-in security measures when you live in enriched and assisted living. But home care often still goes into those homes. They still often will do, not if there's meal um, programs already in the building, but if there isn't, they would provide um, meal preps and things like that. They will, there is often in some of these enriched and assisted living, you can buy private, um, they, they have private services that they organize themselves. So, but you still are eligible for home care to help with the basic tasks that we identified earlier in this present in the in the PowerPoint. Um, so, once um, if you were to move to a, an enriched and assisted living and it didn't work out, or if you were, stayed in your home and knew that these would never work, then you would look at and you but you knew you needed that extra help. You would look at probably a personal care home. Now, personal care homes um, are, they provide actual care. So um, they're varying costs in that. Um, they are private businesses and um, people with dementia also, all, all, a lot of the times end up in personal care homes because they provide the 24 hour supervision that is often needed when somebody's memory isn't functioning well. Um, they, you, there's a whole, like I said, there's a website that, it, that shows all of them. You would, um, need to match the one that is specific to your loved one. Like some of them have up night staff. Some of them don't, um, some of them are on a different side of the city in that there may be different languages spoken. They are not typically run with a nurse, although there is some personal care homes that are owned and operated by nursing by a nurse and have that ability. But typically they are not um, owned. Some of the bigger organizations have open personal care homes. So um, you have like Luther Care Group has some of the personal care homes. Um, Preston Park, Stonebridge Crossing. So there's some really big personal care homes, um, which are lovely if, if the, the resources are there to afford them, they're, they're quite nice. But they are varying ranges. There is also a subsidy um, through the Ministry of Health that once you live into a personal care home that you can apply for. Um, so that being said, if a personal care home is not appropriate based on they cannot manage their your care needs or if you have moved to a personal care home and 10 months later the personal care home is not managing the care needs you can um we would look at long-term care now long-term care um is based on assess need again uh, cpas would do an assessment and they present it to the long-term care panel they are looking at things so um so the difference of, I always say, and it's not quite this black and white, a personal care manages a one person tasks um, on the lighter side. So if you just need a little bit of help getting dressed, um, help to the bathroom and that a personal care home manages that quite well. Um, when you start needing two people um, or any kind of mechanical lifts or that, we're really looking at long-term care homes or if you need a secured environment. People with dementia often who are very mobile and physically well, um, often need what we call a secured environment, which would be in our long-term care homes. Um, there's, there's, I think, four homes that have the secured environment. Um, anyways, you are eligible, you can access any home in the province. What comes, what we assess for with CPAS and that is the Saskatoon and the immediate mm -hmm. urban. We also would reach out to any other place in the province that any of our clients were looking to access. The other one that has come about over the years with, that's trying to deal, build some capacity in the long-term care homes and in acute care is the direct client funding. And um, like Sean said, we could probably have a whole presentation on what this means, but direct client funding is, is it gives you the ability to use the resources that were that you would have 
that would have been allocated to you to you be used in um, a long term care. So the funding's not huge and it usually works with when you have informal supports like um, a wife, a daughter, a husband or somebody who's gonna provide a lot of the care but needs some extra help to that. Um, and this program works well for those individuals. Um, so how do you access CPAS? Through a self-referral, you can just phone and ask for services yourself. Uh, referral from your family doctor, nurse, therapist, or other healthcare professional. Um, just keep in mind that the client, that the individual would have to agree to having our services, even though you can refer them, they still have to agree. And in the hospital, contact the CPAS coordinator on that unit. You could just ask your nurse and they would easily do that. So our phone number is 306-655-4346, and that would give you central intake. Uh, or you can, doctors often fax orders to 306-655-4343. So I'll give it back to Shan and the questions. Thanks very much, Deborah. That also was a whole lot of information to digest at one time. Um, so I'm not sure, and I'll, I'll check with June later about how available both of the the slide uh, presentations are that our, our presenters gave us this morning. But I'm just uh, touching my screen now to look up um, as we open it up for questions. Um, and I'm gonna, I, I know Sangeet has been um, answering a couple of them, but I'm just uh, gonna go back to you, Deb, um, for one quick clarification. Um, you mentioned that COVID has been affecting some of the available services. Is it affecting actual CPAS? Um, if I phone and ask for service there, um, will the, the CPAS client care coordinator still guide me through what is available or are CPAS services also limited during COVID? Um, absolutely, reach out to CPAS and we will help guide through you. Where our resort, what happens, um, when, have, when services shut down a bit or reallocate, so when there's not as much home care and um, there's not respite, we get busier trying to problem solve different options that don't exist. So as much as our staff are not stopping our services, the volume has increased and, and there may be a delay, but we are trying to prioritize and see who we can, who has the greatest need. So definitely phone in and ask. Okay, because I'm just thinking that it's um, it's kind of um, opposing needs. Um, COVID makes things worse for people um, and probably increases their needs at home if they're isolated. On the other hand, if there's fewer resources from the health system, it might be harder to make that match up with what is available. But I, I will, thank you. And I will I'll move on to Sangeeta. There was a question asked um, by, by one of our, our, our um, former board members, about 811 and um, what if 811 callers tell us that we need to go see our family doctor and we don't actually have a family doctor? What will they do in that case? So there's a couple of different options that are available. Um, we can provide you resources for virtual or telephone consult. Um, and many of the physicians offices now are actually offering a, a more a, like a telephone consult as well. When we initially COVID hit a lot of the um, clinics and medical offices did a complete shutdown, but we are noticing that there is much more availability that way. We also have the ability to transfer depending on the disposition to our physician secondary triage. So after they've spoken to a nurse or a mental health clinician, we can certainly transfer this person for more assessment with a physician as well. Okay, that, that's very helpful. And just one follow-up question then. Um, uh, one of our members was asking about 811 is based out of Regina, but it is a provincial service. Absolutely. So some of the services that Deborah was mentioning would be some of the services that we would provide. Um, also, um, it is a provincial service. So absolutely anyone who is living in Saskatchewan can call 811. And okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have uh, another question that was asked that I'm, I'm going to actually direct to both of our, our panelists. And that was, um, someone was asking about uh, what if 811 gets a call from someone 
um, who uh, thinks there may be some older adult abuse going on in a situation. Um, and I would, I would maybe ask Sangeeta first, but I'll also ask Deborah to follow up because what happens when one of your client care coordinators, coordinators may identify the potential of abuse happening in a home situation? But I'll ask Sangeeta first and then ask Deborah to follow up. Sure. Um, we do get calls like this, unfortunately. Um, but one of the biggest things that we would do is assess for safety first. And I, I think that's the primary thing. And, and whether there is some immediate um, danger, whether it's physical, emotional, sexual in nature, what kind of abuse is happening, uh, whether it's financial abuse um, or exploitation, um, it could be intentional or unintentional neglect um, that that person is experiencing. So we would gather the information. Now, if there is a risk to safety, um, and we need to you know, contact someone on behalf of that person, um, we can do so. Um, there's discrete ways of doing that, as well as you know, if something is, is just needing more immediate attention because that person's physically hurt and they need help right away. There's different ways that we would handle it. Um, and we would also provide the person who's calling with some tips and tools on what to do to manage their present situation and who they could be reaching out to. Um, and first of all, whether they're capable or not capable, uh, how dependent are they on that care provider? Um, we would also, we have protocols on elder abuse as well that we would run through to see um, some other options that are available. And always we will give them community resources that are accessible to them. Um, one of the biggest thing is to determine whether there's imminent harm. So if somebody is in active danger, we would escalate right away because there is imminent harm. But if something is ongoing, we would be doing some more probing to see the level of urgency that's required for that person. Right. And, and, and Deb, I, I'm not meaning to put you on the spot at all, but I can imagine that it would not be an unheard of that one of your client care coordinators would go into home and possibly see the potential of abuse here. Um, what tools would they have at their disposal to try and intervene? Um, well, I'm going to, and this is sort of a loaded question. <laughs> um, they, because, you know, there's abuse, like Sangeeta said, if somebody's in imminent danger and you, you would phone 911, like we're out in the community mainly, when people come out into acute care, there's it's a different sort of approach. Um, it's not always clear abuse. It, it's often suspected or something and you'll do some investigation in that. There is no department in the province that I'm aware of that you can just phone and then investigate all this stuff. So you're usually pasting things together. I'll use, um, an example of one client that we dealt with that we felt, and there was there was reasons, it wasn't all that, it's not all that, abuse can happen even that there's not bad people behind it, it's bad situations. And mm -hmm. so um, this was a bad situation and some, um, an individual was not being taken care of by her, her daughter. And, um, but the daughter, didn't really have the means to either. And um, so it was interesting because we used different rules in that to manipulate, not manipulate, that would be the wrong word, to, to get the, the officials in there because officials are also tied about how they can take somebody out of the home and things like that. So we got, and we had to use the Mental Health Act and all these different pieces just to get them to the emergency department. and. And the client didn't want to go, and there's many reasons behind that. And we did, but we ha we were able to get the person not medic mentally sound to make those decisions and get them to emerge and then get her the care she needed. And, and we followed through with that. But so we typically work through it on a one-to-one, -one, on a one-by-one -one basis. We have a lot of, um, we have ethics um, to, that we can connect with in the province. Those, those are all changing. There's so much changes happening right now. So, but we have access to ethicists. We have access to lawyers. We have access to a lot of people that will help problem solve and, and um, help support that situation. They're not always that, that easy to solve, but we right. do try to go through them. 
Right. And I realize I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but we all know that it, it's one thing to say the clinical rules of how things happen. And it's another thing to actually um, try to work with families and individuals in getting them the kind of care they need when they themselves may not um, understand all of the different things that are happening for them. I want to switch a little bit now um, to talk a little bit more about long-term care and ask you, Deborah, um, some of our, our, our listeners are interested in the waiting lists for access to a nursing home and uh, how that works, how many applications you have to make and where you go and how long is the waiting list? Okay, so... Um... So just, I just want to back up and want to put a plug in about the, uh, the abuse and that. Um, really, I encourage everybody to have a power of attorney. That may sound really simple, but we do have people that come to acute, mainly that's where it shows up, and they don't have the capacity to make those decisions and there's no power of attorney. That becomes very expensive for a family to go after guardianship and that, and it changes the trajectory of planning and that. So anyways, I'm just putting a plug in. People sure. should try to get those things done prior to ending up in the situation. Um, so, okay, um, about long-term care. Um, long-term care, um, like I said, part of accessing long-term care is that you've exhausted community resources. So um, going from living completely independent to living in a nursing home, happens but generally somebody's had a massive stroke or something like that it's not when we when most of us age um and deteriorate it over time you want to try to maintain them in place as long as possible and then go to long-term care so cpas like i said does an assessment and if it, first off when cpas will because they're highly skilled in this they will tell you that they believe you do or do not qualify like so if the, you do not qualify they'll say we should look at these other options um, if you do, they feel quite strongly that your care needs aren't being able to be managed out in the community anymore and that they'll take you on the assessment process and then they'll present you to panel. Um, there isn't multiple processes. You can come back four months later or something if you're denied. Like it's, it's not a one-time thing. It's a continue. Once you are eligible, like once you do qualify, I mean, okay, so um, you have to accept the first bed that you're offered. The rules have now been changed to, oh, is it 150 or 125, 150 kilometers of the city. You have to accept any bed within that vicinity. Um, you know, although you have to accept that, I'm just going to tell you that that hasn't happened a lot and that shouldn't become a major stressor to you. Um, we do try to work and match people to the best, but that you do have to accept the bed. Um, especially if you're in the hospital bed, we can't keep those hospital beds filled. Um, then, um, if you're in the hospital, you actually start paying long-term care fees the day you're activated on the long-term care wait list. And the reason behind that is that you have, um, you're occupying a bed in the system. It's just not in a long-term care. Sure. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Deb. And I know we could go into this and many other things in way more depth than we have here today. But our, I see our time is running out. And I would like to thank both Sangeeta and Deb. Um, you've told us about a whole bunch more resources in the province that I'm sure many of us didn't know, or certainly didn't know in this kind of detail. So I think we've succeeded in just scratching the surface of how to navigate the health system in the province. And we may have to look at um, session number two and session number three eventually. <laughs> so I'd like to thank both of you for bringing your expertise and being such uh, great representatives of the system itself. And it's comforting for all of us to know that there are people like yourselves and all of your co-workers out there who will help us um, as we attempt to navigate the system. And I'm getting some comments saying, thanks, it was awesome. Um, so just to let you know from our chat that that's what's happening. I'm going to turn it over to June. I'm sorry, June, I haven't left you all that much time, but perhaps you can just wrap it up. And thanks again to everybody. It's been a pleasure for me. Well, I personally, too, in really enjoyed watching these presentations. And thanks, Shan, for being our moderator and also to Deborah and Sangeeta for all the information that they provided us today. 
I uh, didn't get a chance to ask uh, one of our presenters if they could share their PowerPoint, but I know Sangeeta has said she can share the PowerPoint on her presentation to everybody that has registered today. So I can send that out and I'm sure that Deborah also will allow us to, to do that. And it has their contact information on there, just in case there were questions that you had put in the chat that we just didn't get the opportunity to answer, perhaps you can contact them directly. And also I'll be sending out a, an email with all the dates of our upcoming virtual presentations. There isn't just the coffee chat that we do at SCOA, there's also one presentations that we have through our drop-in program and our lifelong learning programs and a whole variety of things. So now that you're on our email list as being registered, I can definitely send out the information to you ahead of time. So when the webinar closes at 10 o'clock, just stay on for a few moments and a survey will pop up and it'll give you the opportunity to answer a few questions because we want to know if, if you benefited from today's session. And it also gives an opportunity to give some feedback. So I think we're finished for now. I think it's a few minutes before 10, but perhaps uh, Kayla, you can stop the... June, were you gonna the... mention the, the January coffee break? Yes, the January coffee break is on January 25th. It's at one o'clock this time. And we will be having two presenters, Dr. Lajamodere and Dr. Ellis, and they will be talking about the healthcare system. So you'll get information on that. And also I've heard back from Deborah, and she said that her presentation, we can also share with you. So you'll get both of them. Okay. Thanks, June. You're welcome. Okay. I finished my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> is this well, all for today? I think this is all for today, Kayla. Okay, well, I'll end the webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.